welcome to the Dellingpot with me, James Dellingpot. And I am so excited about this week's guest. I know I always say that, but actually, this person is really one of my favourite people in the whole world. One of the one of the one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And and so I'm having him back for a second time on on the podcast. And he's got slightly older since the last one. He's now a hundred. Um, his name is is Jim Lovelock, James Lovelock, um, uh, inventor of Gaia theory, independent scientist, general legend. I mean, y- you did amazing things in World War Two, uh, stopping sailors getting burned, uh, all sorts of stuff you've 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 done. But first of all, I want to just talk about your amazing birthday party that you had, the hundredth birthday party. How good was that? Uh- it- did you enjoy I, it? I was in the middle of it, so I couldn't really uh, tell. And I was a bit overcome because I found myself sitting next to a delightful middle-aged lady who uh, um, said all the right things and uh, you felt really comfortable with. And it was only halfway through that I suddenly realised she was the Duchess of Westminster. <laughs> Richmond. Duchess of Richmond. Right. Well, uh, right. Okay. So, Richmond. Sorry, no. Right. So, so she was. She was. Um. Uh. The dis- probably not literally descended from from the um the Duchess of Richmond who had the ball on the eve of Waterloo. Right. Like, yeah. 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 Um. There were. It, it was quite a weird event for me because um, you had an amazing, amazing guest list, and my table was was really interesting. I sat I sat next to your daughter in law, who's who's fantastic, who who was born in northern Uganda and ended up, I think, being driven out by the Lord's Resistance Army and, uh, you know, saw some terrible things. But but your son married well there. I think she she's, did, indeed. She's, she's a really clever girl. And what I loved about her is that even though she's African and even though she's worked for the UN, she's completely against all that nonsense about give us more aid, we are yes. Africans, we are... St-. She She's really against that. She wants to do it herself. Yes. Yeah. Well, you you obviously got some independently minded children. How how many have you got? Four. And how many grandchildren? Oh, too many. I got uh, eleven great grandchildren, mostly in Australia. Blimey, that's that must be um, quite rare to live long enough <clears throat> to see eleven great grandchildren. Have have we seen them? I think we have. Yes. Well, I mean, to be on the same planet as them—that's right. And, and, and that's something. That's pretty amazing. And planets are important. Well, we'll come to that in a minute. What I what I want to know is, <coughs> oh, see, I'm dying already, and you're and you're fine. You're looking really, really well. Um, Thank and, you. And and uh, you're you're totally there. And what I want to know is, how do I get to live to a hundred and or, or beyond and be as as sort of um, hale as you are? It's not a difficult question, really. I think um, the most important thing is not to smoke. Right. Okay. Well, that's... we 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 are of a generation now. They've stopped it anyway. But I grew up. My mother was a suffragist, mm. and uh, part of the suffragist. A sort of belief was that it was women's right to smoke; men alone should not be. Oh, right! So they were smoking for out of as a political gesture. That's right. right. So I grew up in a house full of cigarette smoke; hardly see the other wall. Is is that what put you off? Do you think you just couldn't bear? Being... No, it didn't. It, it made me a confirmed smoker. So I smoked for about thirty years, right? Or Forty years, yeah. And that gave me a heart attack. And I thought, hey, Jim, you've got to stop this now uh, or, or you, you won't live to be a hundred. And did you, did you smoke seriously? I mean, were you, were you sort of, what, 30 a day or something? Or? Uh, yes. Because people did in those days, didn't they? What, what, what did you smoke? Capstan full strength or something? No, uh, players. Players Navy Cup? Yes. Yeah. Um, if you were a writer, I think smoking's almost an obligate drug, isn't that? Totally. Totally. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I, it depends what kind of writing. I'd say that for, for general writing, smoking is pretty essential. And, and, and you definitely build up a connection between the act of writing and smoking. That's right. You think of that sort of phrase they, they, they use. Uh, uh, 
the coughing hack with a hacking cough. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which I suppose is why a lot of and and the drinking, of course. Do where where are you on drinking? Nowhere at all. Never have. Um, occasionally, uh, but never liked it. And it, it always left me feeling a lot worse the next day, so I thought, oh, to hell with this. My, my vice, I have to say, is, is, is the weed. I like, um, I like marijuana. Um, oh, well, so do we. Oh, do you? Uh, yeah, but, but we take it medicinally. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Well, it's meant to be very, what, what's it called? Um, CBD. CBD, oil. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Hemp extract. Gets rid of all the extra. I wouldn't be without it twice a day. Right, right. Well, is it where? What's where is it? Um, Grown? No, no. Is it is it is it legal or semi legal? Oh, completely legal. Right. You can buy it over the uh, internet, can't you? Mm. It's grown in Israel, I think. Right. Yeah, I mean that that's one of been one of the massive developments of the last ten years, hasn't it? The growth yeah. of this of this marijuana industry. Yeah. And. I should think the drug companies are going furious because it's a a complete competition on profits. Yeah. Yeah. And it's getting heard about more and more. If you tell people you're taking, ah, they say. Yeah, Yeah, they think you're taking the wacky backy and you're getting Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I can't, what I would say against the weed as a kind of recreational drug as opposed to a sort of medicinal drug is that um, it's, probably good for creativity it's probably good for writing rock songs but it's probably not very good for writing kind of scientific books i would imagine or anything that requires concentration or well a lot depends on the science you're doing. Yeah. i can think of some scientific writing that could badly do with some <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there is that there is that uh, you've you've had a book out this year um which i think is there can't be many hundred-year-old writers, um, called The Nova Scene. Yeah, well, it was partly written with Mike, uh, sorry, um, Brian Allaby. Brian Brian Appleyard, yeah, the Sunday Sunday Times, who is is a very good, very good journalist. Um, And a good friend, too. Yeah, he was a he was a he was another he was your guest list was amazing. Actually, before we go on to go on to the the Nova Scene, I had some sticky moments because he, as you know I am not a fan of a lot of elements of the environmental movement and the kind well, of these are my well we can come to that as well but some of the people um Chris Bintekel for example who I know is a, a a good mate of yours um but I consider him you know one of the a, a wrong one because he goes around lecturing people about goes around sort of lecturing church chores, telling everyone that that we're doomed and it's all our fault and there's nothing you know we, unless we embrace kind of renewables and stuff we're we're, we're all going to die and I just a I don't believe it and b I don't I think he's what he's advocating is completely the wrong the wrong thing to save the planet. Uh, is he really doing this? I think yeah. My How dad's my dad my dad went to see one of his one of his things in Malvern, which is which is actually. Um, it's like a pushing at an open door in Malvern. Malvern's like going to going to Totnes or somewhere. They're all kind of into that into that hair shirt stuff. Well, the problem is, you see, I consider Christian the best of friends. Yeah, and I do you too. Mm. So you and can't be rude. No, I'm not. I'm not yeah, you can't rude. be that bad. No, and no, and also, he was the first person in the country of any significance to uh, recognise Gaia and see that it was uh, a theory that was, you know, fairly likely to be accurate and he could, he could put his shirt on without running too much risk. And uh, he's stuck with it ever since. So when faithful you... people are, are, are quite something special. I think Gaia, Gaia theory now is, is generally accepted as a, you know, it's taken for granted now. But when you when you first wrote that book, did people think you were a complete nutcase? Yes, and it was worse than that. There's a certain American group that can't bear the thought, I think, of any Brits coming in and producing stuff. And uh, there was some very nasty anti-Gaian propaganda, is the only word I can think of, and tricks played to try and um, put it down. And if you've got 
the American power and force behind uh, their arguments, then it's very difficult to stick with it. And that's been a pretty hard, I don't know how many years, 30 years, is it? Mm. It's a hell of a long time. Um, actually, Jim, do you mind, can you, if, if you move your mi microphone, because you're looking at me, because you're polite, no, if you just move over here, because you're, you're so polite looking at me, um, and the microphones are, the, yeah, that's, that's all right. right. Yeah, that's better. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes, you made the intuitive leap because you, you weren't bound by any particular field. You just, that's right. you like leaping all over the place. And also, nobody paid me any money for it. No, no. Um, I mean, apart from book publication, I mean that, and that, that's not the same thing. So you mean that that, in a way, when you're being paid money for things, it kind of it sort of corrupts your the way of thinking. It's oh, no, I wouldn't call it the very reverse of corruption. If you accept, shall we say, some really hefty sum from a publisher, yeah, which you'd never get, like ten thousand quid, yeah. Um, you feel an obligation. You've got to do a good job for it. Oh, I see, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so now it sort of, it, it, it makes sense that, that the planet is, is one organism. Um, but where does, where do we fit into all that? I, I mean, because one of the things that disturbs me about, about, the, about the environmental movement, that, and, and I think this is particularly a problem with ecology as a, as a field, is that it seems to, to start from with the view that we humans are a cancer on the planet, whereas I kind of think, well, we're a, we're a key part of it. I mean, we, we're the one that gives it consciousness, and we're the ones that create art, and we're you know we're not a, we're not the plague that that I think a lot of environmentalists see us as. Oh no, you you are absolutely right. The the planet would not uh, be worth a damn without us. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're the triumph of, of uh, life's existence in many ways. It's quite amazing that just a few atoms, no more than a few, billions of atoms could come together after a supernova explosion. Um, that's you know, the biggest nuclear explosion you can think of, short of the Big Bang, and, uh, and for, form themselves into all these oddities like living cells and eventually animals and eventually us yeah it, it, it's it's the most wonderful and remarkable event and it, it kind of i mean there have been not theories i call it games uh, uh invented by people who like to think of the cosmos as uh, this collection of bits and pieces, and somehow they come together, or somebody moves them together like pieces on a chessboard, until you form the kind of Earth we've got. But, but the very unlikeliness of, of, of our existence is is also the reason why, I, I was very sad to read this in your book, there, aren't, there isn't other life out there. I mean, That's right. We're not going to find another planet with no. people like us on it. Or no, it, not no. a bit, no. Which is... A bit lonely making, maybe. Not really. Not not to me. It doesn't. <laughs> I'm not very. Uh, I grew up very much a loner. So um, the absence of that, the other sorts of people is no no lo loss to me. Would do you think um, that we're going to colonise planets, uh, other planets, one day? No. Oh. Definitely no. Uh, it's quite likely that we are the only living. Uh, only planet with life on it. Right, but c could we not make other planets habitable? Oh, you mean deliberately? Yeah, yeah. Well, in a way, uh, that's already been done. I mean, there's been men on the moon. You might say, therefore, the moon was inhabited by people. Yeah, but I'm talking about kind of domes with with vegetation and... Sort of. Yeah, but really, really big do you know, like, I know what you mean. Like yeah, in science right. fiction movies. Yeah. Um, well, there's no point in it, and who put the money up? Well, yes, I suppose it depends, doesn't it, on your view of what population's going to do and when it's going to peak. I mean, I, I read somebody this year quoting a figure of 11 billion, but I, I, that seems quite high to me. By when? By, by the end of this century, they said. 
Well, if we reach the end of this century, yeah. which some people seem to have doubts about, um, I don't think there'll be that number on. If there were, then it would kind of prove itself. That would be too many. Right, right. What do you, you, you don't seriously think we're not going to make the end of the century, do you? I don't know. I mean, I, mean, I think you, prob- probably you won't, because you told me the last time we met that the longest you get to live is 110, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Good so, memory. So you've got nine more years. Um, uh, that's so th- a long time. That won't see you to the end of the century. But, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling... Don't, don't depress me, Jim. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident we're going we're gonna to make it. You know? I mean, m- that means my, my kids are going to see... Yeah, my kids will see, see the end of the century. And my grandchildren certainly will. I can't do sums. My arithmetic's terrible. Is it? Always has been. Oh, really? Yeah, I failed my exams in arithmetic, and I can prove it. It was exhibited in uh, the Science Museum some time ago. I assumed that because you're a scientist, you'd be good at the maths. No. No, no well, I am, but not at um, arithmetic. Uh, well, what, what, what other maths is there then? Oh, God. I mean, there's, to start with, Newton said... God, this arithmetic is terrible. <laughs> That's never passed my exams here right. at Trinity. Uh, uh, and so he invented calculus. Right, OK. Which is so difficult from the uh, academic point of view that uh, they thought, ah, oh, this is perfect. That's what we want. And one of the themes in in um, the Nova scene, which which is basically, am I, correct me if I'm, if I'm summarising it wrong, but... Um, you're arguing that we're coming to the end of the period known as the Anthropocene, yeah. which is which is really Machines. industrial revolution, where where man really makes an enormous impact on on the planet, and now that period is just about over, and we're going to enter a new age where sort of robot like things are going to live in parallel with us. If you, if you don't mind, I'll say you put that the wrong way round. Okay. The Anthropocene was the time machines took over. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, um, the the uh, Novocene is the time that the machines are downgraded to what they are, no more than machines. And uh, uh, whatever is the life form, the central one, takes over. I don't know what it will be. Right. So initially we're going to create these things ourselves to be our servants, and then they're going to start doing clever things themselves and eventually have a sort of parallel existence with ours. Yes, the, the model really is the perfect vacuum cleaner that not only serves that purpose, but also is a, 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 a butler and a housemaid, everything. Right. I could, yeah, that, that sounds good. <laughs> well, yes, but I don't see that running the planet. Um, well, yeah. I mean, what's it going to do when the gaffer comes in and says, look, it's no use, the supply of vegetation is now not meeting the requirements of the oxygen level of the air. What are you going to do about it? What, you mean, is that the point where it sort of starts killing us? Yes. Because it, well, yeah, well, this is the worry, isn't it? It is. I mean, we, you, you mentioned, is it Asimov's first, the, the three laws of, of, of robots? Yeah. One, one of them is they're not allowed to kill us. <laughs> That's right. Yes, that's but, right. But you make the point that actually this assumes that robots obey the rules, and why should they? Because we don't. Um, so I'm so sl- that's a good point. Um, well, it's your point. But but, but we do mo- do obey the rules. If we didn't, we'd be all dead long ago. Mm. Up to a point. I mean, I mean, no, is- accurately. Well, not all of us obey the rules. Yes, we do. We well, don't don't know we do, but we do. I mean, you don't breathe in any more oxygen than you need, or or is just right to balance the eating of uh, stuff that's made by sunlight synthesis. Right, in that sense, it's yes. all in balance beautifully. Okay, but we break other rules. I mean. You know we're naughty, and sometimes it's it's through breaking well, it's rules. Nice. We, we yeah, we we achieve things, don't we? Yeah. I mean, like I I like I have to say I, I like breaking the speed limit because I I don't see why the police should tell me 
how fast I should drive, you know, within reason. Seems wrong to me. Um, <laughs> but but <laughs> if, if the robots start thinking this way, and it, uh, to follow your example, if they start saying, well, you know, that these humans are, are consuming too much resource, too many resources for the for the planet's carrying capacity we we better take action well that's the, that's the, that's that we're entering the world the realm of of terminator right i don't know whether you've seen the terminator films but that would worry me slightly no i haven't seen them no do you think i should well yeah i mean you've you've you've, you've imagined it anyway i mean this is the world that's that, that that may that may come to exist where there are these these robots which are look like us but but perform much better than us they're strong they're, they're virtually indestructible and um if they turn bad then that's not good for us and you can you can kind of imagine the chinese doing that you can imagine the chinese building war robots can't you yes i suppose so although people change the chinese suffer from too many of them and they have done for a long time they, i i suppose they had such an ideal set up in china we, we, with the food balance and the climate and everything else, that they just multiplied to a, a point where they, they just reached a sort of stasis uh, and stayed at the same sort of civilization for how long? A couple of thousand years. Um, yeah. Remarkable, really. Well, yeah. Well, do, do you think that <clears throat> I've often wondered this, um, particularly since reading, you know, your. Gaia theory. Do you th do you think that that um, when, for example, a nation of what well, what is it, one point four billion, probably one point two billion, um, twenty years ago, um, I don't know what it was when when Mao first appeared, but when a country like that sort of discovers communism and gets really into it big time, do you think that that is a kind of a way of this massive population is sort of unconsciously self-regulating itself and stopping itself growing, thus thus s secretly serving the interests of the planet? Or do you think it's just a kind of random thing? Well, that's an interesting theory. I've never heard that before. Um, well, I wouldn't rule it. You'd have to test it, but um, which ain't going to be easy to do. Well, you couldn't test it, could you? What, what, what could you measure it against? Yeah. But... But but things like okay so, so communism just one example but but okay wars for example or or indeed the rise and fall of civilizations we, or, or, or the, this new thing what is it that they were standing on top of trains about did you I wanted to ask you about that <laughs> extinction rebellion okay That's right, yeah. now so when you have you seen the footage of, I I was, I was going to show you actually. This this morning, um, it'll probably be last week by the time this appears. Um, there was footage all over social media yeah. of this chap standing on top of a tube train, and the the There's furious room on top of it. <laughs> the, the, the the furious punters, the commuters, just weren't having it, and and they started trying to pull him pull him down, and and he tried to kick the head of one chap who tried to pull him down, and eventually he got pulled off the top of the, the the train, because these people who are on their way to work and probably were, are being paid by the hour, so they can't really afford to the, the luxury of watching this. How do you feel about these Extinction, extinction Rebellion protests? Do you think they're doing us a, a favour or do you think they're a menace? It's just, just a, um, a young person's angry rebellion about a lot, any, anything. What's in their minds, I think, is not so much the climate or anything else. They're just working out their hates. Yeah, it's pretty rotten having to go to work every day on the an overcrowded tube train, and. Uh, but, they, yeah, but, but to be fair, Jim, these people probably haven't got the ones who are protesting. Probably haven't got to commute to work on a tube tube train. They've probably got trust funds and things from mummy and daddy. Honest? We, a lot, yeah, they're, they're very middle class. These these. Well, then why are they on a tube train? No, 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 no. The ones queuing up on the platform are, are, are the workers. They're just ordinary they, folk. Like. Yeah, yeah. They're the ones who don't like these, these middle-class kids standing, you know, indulging themselves. Ah, I got you. Yeah. Oh, well, that's too complicated. I mean, that's sociology. I, I didn't do that subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you don't have to done. So I didn't do sociology. I did I did English. I I've got a view. I, d I don't think you need to be. But 
look, I, I, this, this is where I am, and you can tell me where you are. I don't think it's right that that pampered middle class kids should express themselves through the medium of environmental environmental protest at the expense of of ordinary work ordinary people work. Just, just want to get on with their jobs i get <laughs> i entirely agree but then i think had i been about uh, you know their sort of age group and standing on that platform how would i have reacted i'm not sure yeah what well, did you go through a radical phase oh yes who didn't well so what, what was what was your radical period Making bombs and blowing up things. Well, what's radical about that? You weren't. You you weren't. No, you think that's just commonplace. Well, no, I know. I mean, are we talking about World War Two here? Or, Bef- or before, before that? What you what you were making bombs f- for the purposes of anarchy? If you like. What? Well, tell me about that. Oh no, I don't. You you what you seriously were? You were kind of an anarchist. Yes, I think most kids pass through the phase of that kind. But what were you, what were you specifically angry about? That what were you trying to stop? I had very strong views during the uh, Spanish Civil War, and that a lot of kids of my age group felt much the same. Right. So you saw you saw um, the fascists and Hitler fighting their proxy war in Spain. Yeah, and and you were, I mean, were you tempted to go and fight in the Sp- Spanish Civil War, doing George Orwell? Tempted to do things, yes, if I could. Um, I, I should add there that I grew up in a very left-wing family, indeed. Right. And uh, rather glad I did because it gave me completely a very hard view of of one side of the picture, and. Uh, I, as a spectator reader, obviously, I've come around Well, clearly you have, but, but you must have a vestigial sympathy with the pro- proletariat or whatever you'd like to call them. Well, of the, course the, I the do, workers. yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that makes sense. Um, had, you, had you, of course, gone out to, to Spain to fight in the Civil War... Yes. I would you, probably have finished up like Orwell. Well, you, well, Orwell was lucky because he got wounded and just got out just in time. time but, yes. but I think he would have been shot by his own. You'd have, you'd have been shot by your own people. Yes, because the commies were at least as bad as the as the other side. Oh yes, no, I, I, I I'm very well aware of the nastiness of some of that lot. Yeah. So, so okay. Well, because you're wise and benign, how how do we? channel this this youthful youthful rage in a, in a in a good way or rather how do we uh, yeah how do we channel it in a good way and how do we stop it kind of disrupting the, the lives of just people who want to get on and bring up their families and give their children a better future and stuff that's no easy question i think the first answer i give is everyone has their own way of dealing with that class of problem um Try and stay fit and healthy as you can, because if you do, uh, your brain will work a bit better, and uh, there's no harm in the intelligence. In fact, uh, it's the one thing we need more than anything. Yeah. I read this amazing book um, a few months ago, and I, I actually had the chaps on my, my podcast who, who have this theory, uh, and quite well supported, that the average IQ of humans is dropping per decade and the reason for that is that advances in medical technology mean that that you know sort of the underclass as it were the the sort of the people of low intelligence who would hitherto have been the first to go in any kind of starvation or disease situation and now multiplying now multiplying whereas the the cleverest people can't afford to have children or or, or right. won't have children yeah. because of their careers and does that make sense to you that theory well, it makes a lot of sense but it, it obviously varies enormously from nation to nation country to country um it, if you talk to a coma about it she would have told you that there are parts of africa where that doesn't apply i can i can believe that where a coma comes from um yeah, well, I mean, where where there is this still the struggle and survival of the fittest, if That's you like, right. probably the average IQ is is rising. But I think in the West we we've we've pretty much peaked, haven't we? I mean, isn't isn't yeah. isn't what's going on now? All the kind of 
uh, the chaos over over Brexit, the um, uh, the Extinction Rebellion nonsense. Isn't that isn't that all symptomatic of a of a of a civilization that's that's kind of peaked? You're probably right. I don't know because it's easy to make yes or no answers to questions like that. Yeah. But you've really got to go and look at it and study it fairly closely and see see what they're up to. Yeah. You can get some nasty surprises. Like what? Well, I think the biggest surprise I had in my life of uh, destructiveness was during the early part of World War Two. I had the job of wandering in along the uh, underground shelters, the old tube tunnels, just to looking for uh, organisms that might spread an epidemic. There was, I think the government were mostly afraid of a flu epidemic, like the one at the end of World War Two, Which killed uh, more under, people, I think, than the war, did Under stretcher it? conditions. Under, sorry, uh, not stretcher, under the uh, conditions in the shelters. Yeah. You, and... Uh, that would affect mainly the working class people on whom they depended much more than the now. Yeah. And uh, in the course of this, I found kids, working class kids, undoing the bolts on the side of the steel plates that held the mud outside away from us and selling them. And... <laughs> What you mean? They were taking the part. The, the they take the, the, the four the, all but four bolt, bolts off or nuts off, and and go and sell them to the ironmonger or whatever. Um, how did how, so? Did you report that? And and how did they? How did you do it? Because I mean, that could have been a massive it's tunnel collapse. One small bomb near the tunnel and bingo, that would be it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. Well, yes, I I passed it on, but everybody knew. There's all sorts of stuff that that you can't do anything about it. So. The, the, what I've realised later on in life is is that all the kind of myths I I was served up by by Wolf. I mean, you know, I was I was at a, at a traditional English prep school um, in the in the 1970s, yeah. and all we ever used to watch on on the on the projector were were war movies, things like. Dunkirk and stuff and you sort of celebrating the stiff upper lip and stuff and what you what you discover when you read about the war is that it wasn't quite, quite like, like that. that no it wasn't I mean what <laughs> tell me some things that, that that would shock me about 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 that era I wish I could because you should have given me notice <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry that's cruel uh, uh, Oh, but, but okay, so one of the things that I learned because I because I I used to in, interview World War Two veterans was that they would get their their tanks out in the desert, which had been shipped over from I suppose Liverpool or somewhere. Yeah. And what they would find is that the dock workers had chipped to where, chipped off all the all the kind of the the compass and all the the anything you could get money with. Yeah. So that so that their their, their tanks were were pretty the, the, used. The, yeah. Pretty useless. Yeah, um, that doesn't surprise me at all. So people were all, all, all pulling together, and particularly the, the, the communists were all supporting Uncle Joe. Well, Stalin. don't don't forget, if you're talking about Liverpool, a lot of it was part of another war that was going on between Ireland and Britain. Yes, there's that as well. That complicated it. Mm. Well, you've seen a lot, um, and. I'm hoping that you're going to have some cheery messages for how things are going to pan out from here on in. I mean, you, you, you seem to have, your views on 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 just how big a bigger threat climate change is seems to have shifted. You know, I, I think in 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 one of your books, were ten years ago, you were kind of that's we, right. You we, we were totally doomed, and we were all going to have to retreat to the yes the, the poles. Well, I think we're discovering more and more about it. And uh, one of the best books there's been on uh, the, the future of the Earth during this period that we're in was the one by the astronomer royal, Martin Rees. Mm -hmm. um, the last, what is it, last hundred years or, so, or our final hundred years. I've forgotten the title, right. but, it, but it's, you can easily find it. 
Martin Rees is his name. Yeah. Uh, now that I think is one of the truly wise books, and much of what I'm, I'm saying really follows on from that. It's just I filled in a few of the details by going out and measuring things. Right, right. Well, um, I, you and I disagree on the on the degree to which anthropogenic um, influences are catastrophically warming the planet. I, I, I just don't think it's. I just don't think it's an issue at all. But if it is an issue, I do think we're going about it in the wrong way at the moment. Okay, well, I'll, I'll state my case. Yeah. If we go on burning fossil fuel the yeah. way we've been doing, yeah. we are doomed. Right. Because for simple reason, you, you don't have to warm the Earth much to set in course automatic, almost automatic processes in, in, the, in the Earth's physics and chemistry. You're talking about, about that, that, feedbacks? That will run, run up the temperature to impossible levels. So, so you're talking about the, the forcing effects of, of of a CO2 increase, which would which will trigger various feedbacks, which will make That's it right. make it even worse. Yeah, yeah. That, I I understand the theory. I I just so far I'm not seeing any evidence of this in terms of, for example. No, but if it's going to happen in fifty years, right? Why would you see anything? No. Well, that's okay. So I I, I accept that that's a it's a possibility. Um, and I accept the well. I sort of accept the the idea of Pascal's wager that that it's better to do something just in case to avert the. But if we are going to do something about it, I think you and I agree that it's got to be nuclear, hasn't it? Oh yes, I don't. I don't have any doubts on that one, except with one that that they're claiming that you can produce fifty percent of the energy we need in Britain by renewable energy. I don't know whether that's absolute lies or, or from the ad, ad men or, or whether it's true. But assuming for a moment it's true, then it's just possible that nuclear would, is not required in full. Right. I think it's lies. And, and uh, uh, I mean, this is... Uh, well, you're closer to the industry than I well, am. Well, one, one of my beefs is with the whole environmental thing. I mean, I, look, like you... I'm an environmentalist, a real environmentalist. I actually like, I, I, unlike oh, I some greeners, I love nature. I, we, yes. Here we are in one of the most, I think, you've, you've got just about the most, the best place to live on earth. Well, we tried hard and we walked a long way too. <laughs> it's just fantastic. I mean, just describe it. I'm, I'm looking out through your window onto Chesil Beach in, yes. in, in Dorset and you've got a kind of, palm tree like like thing where well, it's not obviously a palm tree what, what is it it's a it's a you've obviously got some kind of uh, microclimate down oh here. sandy she's the gardener i don't know but so you walk out through your garden onto the beach and i can see the the, the waves coming in and uh overlooking your house is the is this upland which is just fantastic views from the top and quite high too by yeah. the 800 feet and there's heathland where you got bitten by an adder yeah which is, which I think is quite, <laughs> I'm kind of envious of that. I think it's, it's quite cool to have been. Well, there's working with nature, isn't it? Have you, uh, by the way, have you been attacked by any other interesting creatures uh, in your in your long life? No. What the adders? The oh best? yes, no, anthrax organisms. And you've had anthrax. Yeah. And how 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 was that for you? I don't know. I was unconscious much. Of the time. Oh really? What what does anthrax do to you? Well, not very much immediately as I could see. Just produced a kind of nasty wart on my hand, and then I felt ill, and then ill, and just passed out. But was that was that accidental contamination in the lab? I don't know. I don't know. It's just one of those things. It, it must have been something lab involved, uh, because anthrax isn't that common. It, it does exist in Britain. Yeah. I mean, a dead cow is quite capable of in incubating a lot of in anthrax is it oh i thought i thought i thought it was something they'd, they'd eradicated i thought that the, that the last supply was in the lab and they just killed it um they say that oh i see so it, it could come back oh sure it's not a very um how can we put it it's not the most deadly disease it's not as bad as ebola is it no no nothing it does not not comparable 
no, no. I, I definitely wouldn't want to get Ebola. It's not, um, it's, it's not as bad as a bad influenza. But, um, right. Okay, right. So, well, the, 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 you've, you've stopped it being so exciting, your anecdote now about, about anthrax. <laughs> um, but, oh, yes. I know we're going to have... But it's a lie. This is... Five minutes. Okay, yeah, good. So, Jim, um, I was coming around. We're talking about what amazing environmentalists we are and how we both love nature. What really... My, the, the really thing, that, the thing that most annoys me about, about environmentalism is that it seems to be geared towards pushing renewable energy, particularly wind turbines, which I, mean, I call... Are, is there any money coming in? Y yes, there is. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Ponzi scheme, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's... that's right. Uh, well, my view is, for a long time, which may be completely wrong, is this, that, that an enormous amount of money is spent on anti-nuclear propaganda. Yes. Because... It, it's so harmless. You can see the bloody figures. Is it, if you run a nuclear power station, uh, your insurance company ought to give you almost perfect rates because it's a very healthy place to live, to work in, and people who work there live longer than the rest of them. They do, don't they? What, what's yeah. it called? Hormesis? Yes. But it, it isn't hormesis. It's just it's very safe. Oh, I see. Right, okay. Right, they're just a safe environment, okay. That's right. Yeah. And so it's all lies they're telling about it. And where does the money for the lies come from? Well, the coal and oil industries. And, see, and the wind industry. And, the, well, they're, they're small compared with the oil and coal. And they are just deadly frightened yeah. of that any moment now is going to really be realised by the major governments that if they don't stop it, they're, they're done with yeah, yeah. I, as I was driving down, I, I spotted a wind turbine ruining a valley. Um, I'm very glad to see that, that there is none overlooking your particular stretch area. of, yeah. which, which, uh, is that because it's a, a specially protected, protected area? Yeah. Well, thank goodness for that. I mean, because they are, they are the thing, if I had to ban one thing, you ban that. So would we. You join the club. Or that. Well, I might ban the BBC first, and then the wind wind turbines. But <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a way, they're related. It's like it's like you know, uh, I don't know what it would be. It's like if you eradicate the malaria mosquito, you eradicate malaria. In the same way, if you eradicate B, the BBC, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me briefly why you what what your objection to wind turbines is. Uh, I know what mine are, and I, I'm always rehearsing them. But tell me about yours. I. I, th I think the arguments for using them are silly and inaccurate and uh, misleading <laughs> but, and, un and most of all uneconomic. So no, I just think it's a, it's a silly answer to a, 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 an important problem. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm glad you said that. Uh, we've, we've now got to go and have lunch, um, which is, of course, far more important than, than me wittering on about my random views. Um, Jim, thank you very much for coming on the podcast again well, i hope I'm, i was coherent enough. you were very coherent i'm going to give you your special friend badge and i'm hoping that that this is important this badge business your 100 it gives a solidity to the whole thing that it, otherwise might make me think it was frivolous yeah, indeed and we couldn't have that i mean frivolity no, no, there's no. no place for that <laughs> but i just want i just want want you to promise me that around your 109th birthday you'll do and do another podcast you know because i, I I fear that 110 might be your final year, but 109 would be a good a good age. Yeah, but I might get another picture from the Queen on my 110th. You, well, you would. Well, you don't. Yeah. You don't even. You don't even get hundred telegrams anymore, do you? I mean, she's, yeah, she's, oh, yes, you do. Do you? Yeah, and a beautiful picture. Oh, okay. I thought that so many people were living to a hundred now that it was it was like overwhelming. Well, no, the, they've kind of the raw mecha mechanized it. So, but it's a nice. It's very. You've got it, Sandy. I do. I yeah. need to put it in the frame. I bought a frame for it. By the way, have you got a knighthood yet? No, because I've got a ch. Is, you you see, see, that overrides knighthood. the knighthood. Does it? What? See, so if you've got a ch, you don't you don't get a knighthood. Yeah. Oh. No, sometimes people no. move from the knighthood to a CH. But not the other way around. Yeah, yeah. CBE. You've made me think, actually, that I'm I'm not going to bother with the knighthood. I'm going to go straight to Companion of Honour. 
Although I rather fear that that Charles doesn't like me, and I don't I don't think William's going to like me either. So I'm. I'm well, worried. he wouldn't like me either. Really? No. Why? Why wouldn't you like you? What you're a bit common. Well, from my views are uh, the opposite of his. He's very green. Yes. So you, you wouldn't describe yourself as a, as, as a, a green. No. Uh, uh, Unless uh, you called me the first one. And well, not quite the first, but very early. Well, in some ways, you are the godfather of green. But but just just tell me briefly why why you wouldn't consider yourself green. Because of the crowd of them, I wouldn't don't want to stand on top of very few trains with ordinary blokes going to work. Yeah. No, no way, I would consider it an outrageous thing to do. <laughs> just because of the theory. Just because of bloody theory. <laughs> Marvellous. Well, well, thank you for coming on the Delling Pod. I'm now going to present you with your red badge. Um, and um, let's go and have some lunch. Thank you very much, Jim. You're welcome.